Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining the keynote session of TalkWalker's first ever social media trends expert series. I'm Todd Grossman, CEO of America's at TalkWalker and with me as co-moderator and co-sponsor for today's session is my good friend, Toby Daniels, founder and executive director of Social Media Week. Toby, it's great to have you as always and so sorry I'm not next to you. <laughs> Hey, Todd, great to see you. Welcome to everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And I am super excited for today's discussion as this topic is very core to our mission and certainly very present at this time. We're, we're joined today by a stellar lineup of marketing leaders from some of the world's top platforms and brands who are here to share their perspective on the future of purpose-driven marketing. Toby and I can't wait to dive in into the conversation with them. But before we begin, a little bit about TalkWalker and Social Media Week. TalkWalker is a listening and analytics company that empowers more than 2,000 brands that help optimize the impact of their digital strategies by understanding conversations at scale. Toby, can you talk a little bit about Social Media Week for those of you who are not familiar? Yes, for the uninitiated. Social Media Week is a worldwide conference. Uh, we're an industry platform, a publisher that brings together a global audience of marketers through live events, webinars, and now, of course, virtual conferences. This year has indeed been a tumultuous and in many cases, devastating one for so many people around the world. And it has been our privilege to work with partners like TalkWalker to bring these essential conversations like this to audiences around the world. Thanks, Toby. As you know, at TalkWalker, we work tirelessly to understand the evolving social media landscape in order to help our clients navigate the topics and trends that are most relevant to them with the near constant growth in active media users and new platforms emerging all the time, we believe that brands should be fully versed in what goes on in social media today and have the right to set of tools to protect, measure, and promote themselves. So for, for five years now, our, our team of experts have interviewed industry insiders and used AI technology to analyze online conversations in the form of text, image, and video to identify the most important social media trends for the year to come. We just released an annual report detailing the strategies that will have the most impact. This year, we've gone a step further with a deep dive on the trends with global experts through a week of virtual sessions. We want this expert series to help you discover which trends of 2021 will be most relevant to your industry and your brand so that we can make the most of them. As we all know, 2020 has thrown a lot of curveballs. And after hearing from the social media experts this year, we wanted to get a perspective from professionals on the ground to understand the day-to-day -day tactics they've been engaging most to connect with audiences in this incredibly unpredictable time. We surveyed hundreds of consumers and thoroughly analyzed social media usage and newsworthy industry developments to evaluate the real impact of the trends mentioned by experts. Extracting the insights around these trends was mostly done through social listening. In the TalkWalker platform, we were able to use features like quick search, sentiment analysis, conversation clusters to extract meaningful insights at the different trends. And in the end, come up with the top 10 social media trends for 2021. With that thorough analysis, we define these top 10 trends that will be most important in social media in 2021. Well, I'm sure you are no strangers to many of these tactics. All of them scale up to a cohesive, successful strategy today. We're here to talk about them, about our number one trend. We can't do all of them. The number one trend, the impact of socially conscious audiences. It's perhaps the most important factor that brands are taking into account as they're planning campaigns and customer outreach for the year ahead. Well, we don't have time now to do them all. I really wanted to basically uh, let you know that uh, this report is on talkwalker.com and we'll drop a link in the chat for easy access and we'll have a Q&A at the very, very end. But now let's get on to the reason why we're all here today. We have this distinct pleasure of introducing our esteemed panelists for this morning's discussion on how platforms can act with purpose when engaging with customers. Over to you, Toby. 
Thanks so much, Todd. Yes, as Todd says, we have some phenomenal leaders in the world of marketing joining us today. First up, we're going to hear from Colleen Stauffer, who is the head of global creator marketing at Pinterest. Then we're going to hear from Harris Bieber, who's the chief marketing officer at Vimeo. And our final speaker is Andy Tu, who is the senior director of brand, content, and social at Postmates. So to kick us off, I'm excited to introduce Colleen Stauffer. As I mentioned, she's the head of global creator marketing for Pinterest. In her role, she oversees campaign planning, strategy, and execution to tell stories that drive inspiration for creators. Colleen, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to see you. Absolutely. So big year for Pinterest, right? Consumer behavior and interactions have undoubtedly turned or taken a very sharp pivot due to the global pandemic. And in turn, Pinterest has seen an uptick in searches and in board creations. So can you like set the stage for our audience today by elaborating on this shift to where you are at this point, doubling down on helping pinners build their community on the platform? Yes, absolutely. So it's been a year, right? So people are looking for inspiration now more than ever and and really not just what inspires them but who inspires them. And you know, at Pinterest, that's why we're so focused on helping creators be successful by building an audience of of hungry, engaged pinners that really really are demanding their ideas today more than ever. Uh, so in this vein, we mobilized very quickly this year when we all learned we were going to be you know, in our homes longer than we had initially thought. And we launched an initiative for creators called Stay Inspired. And we brought thousands of creators onto the platform and, and incentivized them because we knew that their livelihoods were also at stake. Um, so we asked them to really create content with us for the ideas that were most in demand during this time from pinners. So lesson plans, quick recipes, home workouts, of course, work from home desks, setup situations, and Zen moments. Um, so let's run the spot, but tie this campaign all together. Yeah, absolutely. Let's take a look. COVID-19 continues to change lives. The states issue safer at home or businesses shutter their doors. sort of makes the, the hair stand up on your, the back of your neck. It's just been such a, such a fascinating year and we've just had this like kind of peek into people's lives and into their worlds in such a way that I think has just made us feel so much more connected than we previously did before. Can you talk about the ways in which like this campaign came to life and really what it represents in terms of Pinterest community and the sort of this spirit and resilience of like humanity in general? Yeah, you know, for me, it, it's been ultra inspiring to, to really connect these creators and pinners together. And um, it's made my job even more interesting and, and exciting as well. And so I feel so lucky to have even like brought these stories to life. And there's two examples that really came to mind for me when I, I thought about all this work this year. And, and some they're really simple, but they're so meaningful about how the power of you know, Pinterest can cre and create this demand between creators and pinners. So, you know, we found this one pin from this creator, Diary of a Toronto Girl, and she inspired a pinner in Baltimore to create a virtual graduation party for herself just this past June. Um, and the other cool example is we found a pinner uh, named Zikika uh, inspired another pinner in Australia who had plans to move to Paris. And of course, those plans were interrupted because of COVID. Um, and so he chose to redecorate his entire home with a Parisian inspiration. And so, you know, it's, it, I think people are making the best of it, right? And, and pivoting and that's like the word of the year, right? And so for me, it's, it's great to see that 
bringing more creators onto Pinterest and helping them inspire pinners uh, will make many more of these stories possible all over the world. Hey, Colleen, it's Todd here. I, I know that Hi, Pinterest also announced story pins, which is really exciting. Who are these creators you're hoping to attract with the update and the goals with the respect of the types of content and relationships you hope to see here? Yeah, so it's definitely been a, a, an exciting year for creators and for our platform announcing this new format of story pins. Um, our mission is to bring everyone the inspiration to create a, a life they love. And without creators, we simply cannot you know, fulfill on that mission. And frankly, the platform wouldn't exist without creators and their content. And so this year, we really started on a journey to engage a new type of creator who wants to build an audience on Pinterest and engage with our community. And so story pins format was uh, launched for early access just this past September. And this new format really gives creators this dynamic way to tell stories. So it's a format that you can use video plus image plus text overlay and really making it better for creators to share their talent, share their passion directly on Pinterest without needing a website. And for pinners, this means the ideas on Pinterest will be more engaging and more actionable, which is of course what we all need right now is, is more ideas and more inspiration. Absolutely. So cool. uh, uh, unpack it a little bit more for us a little bit. I mean, this sort of idea that it's challenging to feel inspired if you're not represented. Can you talk a little bit about some of the examples in action, like the Make Your World See All Beauty campaign and how you're expanding kind of things like skin tone filters to appeal to a, to a wider and more representative audience? Yes, this is work I'm, I'm very excited about that we just launched last week, actually. But you know, we believe that inspiration begins with inclusion. So this is why we've taken a number of actions this year, for example, increasing the quality and coverage of our skin tone range feature and improving technology to detect, you know, multiple skin tones in search results. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, we couldn't do this without creators. Again, it always goes back to their amazing content and making sure the platform is much more diverse. So with the recent introduction of story pens and popular trending spaces, we also committed to ensuring that 50% of the creators that we manage that we, and are working with come from underrepresented groups. And Make the World See All Beauty, this campaign that we're about to see is really that beginning, that call to action, asking creators to join us on this mission and helping to make sure the platform has more diverse content. So should oh. we check that spot out? Yeah, let's do it. Hey, Colleen, awesome video. Can you elaborate how this will be an important step to increasing the discoverability of diverse ideas and building an inclusive global community at, on this platform? Yes, of course. So over the coming months, uh, we're continuing to make progress on all of our commitments to support change this year and, and ongoing. So whether that's discoverability of diverse ideas to reflect hundreds of millions of pinners on the platform, uh, using our marketing channels to help drive change through campaigns like this, as well as amplifying creators from all backgrounds and all experiences, making sure their voices and their passions and perspectives are heard. In just continuing on the sort of the DNI theme for a second, in, in your view, what's the difference between a specific response to a moment uh, or a movement where DNI feels much more strategic versus carving out a more like long-term view of being diverse and being a diverse and inclusive brand or platform? Yes, it's something that, you know, we've had a lot of time to reflect on this year as well. And so as marketers, we really have the responsibility to do both, right? And so how I think of it is making sure that we weave DNI throughout our teams, throughout the culture, the way we hire, as well as through all of our marketing campaigns and channels and services um, and wherever, you know, wherever else we show up to the world. And so when we, a specific moment comes up, we always ensure as a brand that it makes sense for us to make a statement. And if we're going to make a statement, we make sure we have actions to really back it up. 
Oh, well said. Um, it's it's obviously been a fascinating year, and it's so interesting to see the businesses and brands that have been leading in this moment that have figured out really how to kind of strike the right balance between reacting in the moment and obviously doing right by their customers and consumers, whilst also trying to think long term and trying to sort of think strategically. Um, it's super interesting. So, uh, Colleen, thank you so much for sharing these examples and your insights with us today. Please, obviously, stick around for the Q and A, but. Uh, thanks so much for joining. Thank you. Sir. So as Todd mentioned at the beginning, we will be hosting a Q&A towards the end of this morning's discussion. So please do take this opportunity to drop any questions into the Q&A function um, within Zoom. Hopefully you're all fairly familiar with Zoom at this point. You've had plenty of time to practice. Um, but let's now get on to our next speaker. I'm super excited to welcome Harris Bieber, who is the Chief Marketing Officer at Vimeo, where he, excuse me, just one second, um, sorry, where he has been um, uh, working on a range of different campaigns and activities. Harris, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I started slightly there, uh, Harris, because... Um, Google chose at this moment in time to, to kick me out of uh, my script, but I'm back in now, so it's all good. Um, so let's, uh, let's jump in to the conversation. So um, very much appreciate you jumping in. You and I have had an opportunity to speak a number of times over the course of this year. And certainly uh, very early on in the pandemic, uh, we had an opportunity to um, have a conversation. And, um, and I think it's in, what's interesting about that conversation is that a pretty significant amount has obviously happened since then. Um, so let's talk about, let's go, let's like rewind and let's go back to kind of uh, February of 2020, where Vimeo is in the sort of the, the plans to kind of launch Vimeo Create, I think towards the end of February. Uh, and then no sooner than a week after that, the whole world basically sort of shut down. So talk about Talk about like that moment for Vimeo, the launch of Creator, what actually happened at this time and the ways in which you pivoted to be able to adjust to what was happening around the world. Yeah, but before we do that, don't we all wish we could just rewind and go back to February, 2020? It would, wouldn't oh that be gosh. nice? I think, yep. I think none of us knew at that time what the world would be like eight months later. And I think we certainly all had to navigate that small businesses are one of the groups that have certainly needed to navigate and adapt uh, just to survive. And talking about Vimeo Create, this was a huge product launch for our company. It was the first of its kind for us mobile video editing tool. And the whole purpose of this was to enable small businesses to create short form social videos to help grow their business, grow their brand. We, like many marketing teams, did a whole launch campaign with creative videos around it, not surprisingly, that were set to launch that first week of March. Uh, and we all know what happened the first week of March. And we quickly realized that the community that we serve, small businesses, very quickly didn't care about growing their business. They didn't care about growing their brand. What they cared about was, how am I going to survive? How am I going to pay my employees? How am I going to put food on the table? And we knew we had to pivot. So we scrapped that whole campaign. We put it on the shelf. Uh, and we focused really quickly on how we could help these business navigate the world that was completely in flux. We created templates that were for curbside pickup, delivery, connecting with your employees, directing them to online shops instead of in-store purchases and really everything that the businesses needed to adapt to a world that was very different very quickly. So um, interesting kind of um, connection here in regards to our previous speaker, Colleen, because Vimeo Create is now an official creative partner of, uh, of Pinterest. Um, speak about um, this ability to seamlessly publish videos directly to Pinterest and the ways in which you're sort of expanding opportunities for businesses to establish successful video strategies and also to drive engagement. Yeah, starting at, at the actual point of creation, Toby, when we did our talk during social media week, one of the things, the research that we did together was that we spoke to lots of small businesses and almost all of them, 92% believe that video would help them grow their business. Uh, but almost an equal per 
um, amount of them believe that they don't create video because it's too expensive, it's too complicated, it's too hard. And I think every single business person knows that video is a really effective means of communicating. Uh, it's really effective on Pinterest. The challenge is how do we make it easy? How do we remove those barriers? And so one of that is creating it really simple from automatic videos using templates to help them get started. So when we launched this partnership with Pinterest, we did a few things. One is we created Pinterest optimized templates. So templates that we knew from looking at the stats on Pinterest, working closely with them. What are the videos that work on Pinterest? What gets the community pinning and engaging with that content? And then we made tem templates that follow that model. And then we made it really seamless to publish those videos on your Pinterest account with one click, publishing it, getting the analytics of what's working on your videos. And what I could tell you this, there is one secret to making video that works on every platform and specifically Pinterest, and that is making video. And it sounds really simple, but it's the biggest thing that prevents people from succeeding, which is that fear of putting something out in the world. And what works for one person isn't gonna work for a different audience. So the only way you find out what really works for you is creating content, creating it frequently, learning and adapting to really see what's engaging. And that's really where this partnership makes that a lot easier. Hey, Harris, I, I really have to applaud what you've done and the discipline that you had to put something that you worked so hard on on the shelf and then not only in, in pivoting, but really innovating. And on the other side of your platform, Vimeo supports film productions and has used the pandemic to share some really powerful stories. We'd love for you to share a bit about the grant program and the Stories in Place video collection you launched that features stories of small businesses adapting through the days of coronavirus. Yeah, so you mentioned it. As a platform, we have over 200 million creators, and we use that term loosely, it's but people who create video content. And we serve both the film production, the creative professionals that are making long form content, and also the small businesses that are using video to grow. And within a week, as Toby mentioned, both of their worlds were dramatically shifted. Small businesses had to close their door. Almost every production in the world was shut down. And we said, how do we serve them? How do we help them? So we created this grand project where we reached out to our staff pick filmmakers, who are the most talented filmmakers in the world. And we said, we're going to give you a grant. We'd like you to make a film about small businesses that are struggling and navigating. And by the way, we want that film to be about a small business in your community that you care about. So the passion came through. And what we got back, we got over 200 replies, by the way, and we had to select eight, which was no, no small feat. These films were created in a matter of 12 days. It was using social distancing. This is at the peak of the pandemic when everything was shut down. And I was just floored by what we got back from our community and the business stories that they told. I'd love to share, we have a, a preview, like a highlight reel that we could share with the, with the community today. Do it. Let's do it. Virus because there are a lot. Disruption of daily life happening on a global scale. Restaurants, bars, and cafes will be limited. You're welcome, thank you guys. Let's at least make this a moment that when we look back, we can say, wow, we went through hell. But look at all the lessons we learned and look at how much better we made this I place. think we're all connected. You know, just knowing that the person in Colorado is doing the same thing that somebody's doing in Spain. I don't want to be a hero. I want to do what is kind and responsible. We all have to adapt right now and do things in a non-traditional way. You'd say, well, we just have to get through this because then it's going to open back up. And now we know, well, open back up doesn't mean open back up. And maybe open back up is never the same. Thank you for that, Harris. Uh, let's discuss this notion of local communities and what it means today because it's top of mind for many in the industry. Uh, what do you think are the biggest opportunities you see that the pandemic has afforded when it comes to platforms leveraging their celebrity ambassadors to come together and shine a spotlight on some of this? Yeah, I think even going back, so celebrities, a lot of different things, right? So for us, our community are the celebrities, the people that we like to highlight and focus. And I think I look at that film and I still get chills. Everyone has to remember that was released in April. So it all came together in a matter of 30 days. And you hear that quote at the end and you think about this is a small business owner, how prolific he was. He said, open back up doesn't mean, well, it might never be the same. And you go eight months fast forward, you know, six months forward and we were all experiencing that. So 
the best thing that we could do is leverage the voice of our creators, our communities that have reached their platforms and their social platforms to share a message of impact, to support the local businesses that they care about. And that little ripple in the pond spreads. And to leveraging our community of 200 million to spread the message of supporting local businesses, helping them succeed, supporting filmmakers and creative professionals by giving them work that they could still do remotely but differently is how we've leveraged our community to amplify our message of a small business that probably no one else would see in the world, but we're getting millions of views on that, that short film to say, hey, you know what? My local community has a restaurant also that's struggling. And if I order takeout from them, I could help keep that business in business so that when we come back from all this, they're still there to serve me and our community. Yeah, our connection to local, our support of small business, even our relationship to small businesses has just shifted so much. And, you know, even despite the devastation and the economic impact, I think this will be one of those positives that we draw from this experience is that that connection and that relationship now is more important than ever before. Another partnership that I want to just like reference uh, again with Pinterest is the Creative Festival that you partnered and, and put together together. You put together as part of the partnership. Um, the event featured um, creators and entrepreneurs and editors who sort of came together and collaborated and exchanged sort of insights around, you know, how to build kind of like online communities. To talk about this event and talk about the role of storytelling, particularly, you know, today, particularly in the age of social distancing, and talk about why an event like this put on by platforms like yours can really help to create a more positive like online experience or a more meaningful collaboration like at their core yeah i think at its core by the way this was pinterest festival we were happy to, to join and, and be participants in it but i think an event like this shows that's an event that pinterest probably would have done for their creative community in person, just like social media work is in person, but we know that those events can take place in person today, but we're all yearning for connection and how do we stay connected? And that's what community is all about. And I think mm -hmm. video is serving a really important purpose in that. Doing virtual events like the one we're participating in right now, uh, lets us all communicate better, stay connected, learn tips and tools to help us succeed and stay connected with our own audiences. And that's what really the, the Creator Festival is about. How do you succeed virtually? How do you create pins at work? What's the content that's working for celebrities and also small businesses alike? If you're a beauty uh, per, uh, in the beauty industry or in your e-commerce, what do you need to be doing to reach your audience today and succeed? And that's very different. But by the way, once this is all gone and we are back into a somewhat normal life and we are coming together in person, this is never going to go away. It's going to be an uh, and not an or. Once the, the secret is out now, I think people that was a local business and they could reach people globally and still sell their products or sell their content, they're going to still want to meet in person because you can't replicate that, that connection of that human bond of in-person events, but you're also going to want to reach your community globally. And that's what video, I think the secret has changed and transformed that virtual events and physical events will be coming together as one as we move forward. And it's just a behavior shift. Yeah, I totally agree. Like local stories, but told globally, like they just carry a sort of a different weight, a different significance. And I think that they actually sort of enable a different type of impact. And, and it's just so exciting to see, you know, both your work at Vimeo and, and obviously the work that Pinterest is doing to kind of highlight and illuminate that. And, and I'm really excited actually to kind of like, you know, um, to, to talk to our next guest as well, who's going to sort of talk again about kind of the importance of supporting local businesses. Harris, this was great. Thank you so much for sharing all of this great work, the insights with our audience and the ways in which you guys are, guys are driving impact with purpose today. So again, same with Colleen, still you know, stick around, come back for the Q&A, but for now, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, uh, our final speaker for today, as I just mentioned, is Andy Tu. Andy is the Senior Director of Brand, Content, and Social at Postmates. Since its launch, Postmates has grown to be the number one platform in Los Angeles, amongst many other market in markets, and is beloved by millennial consumers and celebrities. Prior to joining the team at Postmates, Andy served as the CMO at Define Media, where he led marketing for many of the world's largest natively digital content brands. Andy, good to see you. Thanks so much for joining. 
great to be here. I love going third because not only have I learned a bunch, but uh, I get to cherry pick stuff that's happened already and, and talk to it. So thanks to you guys and thanks to your teams, Erica, Gail, everybody who's put this together. No problem. No problem at all. Well, um, we really appreciate you taking the time out for certain. So you're someone who obviously is in a role that places them at the sort of the center of the coal face of creative execution and the marketing narrative of Postmates. So talk a little bit about like this year, right? What, what the onset of the pandemic and your reaction and response to how you needed to sort of serve and support your customers and walk us through kind of how that experience has been and, and, and the work that you guys have been focused on. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's exactly why I was talking about um, Harris and, and the, uh, the presentations prior, because as he was talking, I had flashbacks to what life looked like in, in say, February, because we launched one of the biggest campaigns uh, the company's ever done on Oscar Sunday, which is the biggest day of the year, typically, for Postmates. And um, the creative was something that we really hung our hat on, we're very proud of, but it was not going to play in a pandemic world. And, uh, you know, the quick story, even though you can go find as creative out there, was that it put this surreal environment, what happens when the food fantasy takes over and you're so hungry that you're in this dream state and we had a character in a subway car and it was one burger floating in the subway car, two, five, 20, 500, and then the subway car is taken over by this visual world of, of burgers that he then snaps out of. Um, you can't have people in subway cars. You can't have burgers flying around a subway car in, in the world that we're in. So in the way that we tore everything up and threw it to the side, we went into reinvention mode and we had some pretty big factors at play of now the narrative has changed. One of them is how do we come to the rescue and support of our merchants and back to local merchants. Um, a lot of those were small local businesses, but for one of the first times ever, a lot of these large scale merchants were coming to us and saying, hey, even I, the, some of the biggest brands and restaurants in the world need to have delivery because we don't have in-store dining. And so this very strange uh, push from the industry of please come and help us and us feeling the weight of that responsibility. Then we have the other side, which is a customer base that is home and they're people that are finding delivery for the first time or people that have had delivery and they're cranking up the dials and saying, I want a lot more of it. And so Luckily, you know, we're a company that's used to growing over the last few years, but overnight we see this dramatic growth on both sides. Uh, and then we as marketers have to sit in the middle and say, okay, now how do we talk about this? Um, we can advance the next slide. We had a campaign that started on, on digital. We had a lot of people that we worked with in the talent arena coming to us and saying, how can I support businesses? What can I do right now? And so the example that you see on the left are some of the, the thumbnails of folks who came to us and just wanted to shout out their favorite local merchants. And while you're used to seeing some of these faces on TV and on glitz and glam moments, you're not used to seeing them in their pajamas talking about their favorite pizza place or this one, Tiffany Haddish's, she's in the, the middle of the, the right side, she's cracking me up. She was just talking about how much she loves this restaurant, Mel's Fish Shack. These uh, folks all sent these to us on their own cell phones. And if we, I, I, we had to cut it down into spots, but they went on and on. I love this place, I love this place, I love this place, shout out to this place. And it was really special in the way that we would all say, this is my favorite sandwich spot or tell your friend who comes in from out of town that, feeling in your connection to these local businesses carried that emotion. And we knew, hey, there's something here. Um, we need to go bigger with this, not necessarily even with the talent because there's obviously household names there, but we wanted to take it to other media channels. We then transformed it into the campaign on the right, which again, outpouring from people that are household names, but not household names in talking about where they get their favorite burgers. Um, and so we even had John Legend, who's in the upper right corner here, give us one of his unreleased songs and time the release of the ad to a song that hadn't come out yet, which is this um, really beautiful um, new song that brought a bunch of inspo and positivity to folks. So this is kind of how we navigated, uh, call it May, June timeframe as we were trying to figure out what would creative messaging look like uh, against the backdrop of supporting local businesses and increasing customer demand. You know, it's it's um it's so interesting, and I just mentioned at the kind of the top of this segment that you know you're at the coal face, right? You are interacting and interfacing with your customers. You know, over this sort of time frame, what, what have you learned? Like, or at least what has surprised you most as you've now, you know, been afforded this even more intimate connection with your customers? And, and I think we've all struggled as marketers with what kind of message lands what is your lane before and should you stay in that lane or what are the places that you can stretch and tell different kinds of stories? I think for us as a team, um, 
we didn't want to lose sight of the fact that food delivery and food is such a positive part of people's day and week and life and something that they look forward to. And in a lot of ways, they associate that positivity with these other really feel good moments, right? They associate it with watching their favorite show or we talk about Oscar Sunday. They associate it with these things that like they set their watch by. And so for us, I think it's been trying to stay close to those cultural moments and know that people still want to listen to the new albums that are coming out. They still want to watch sports and it'll speak to some of the things that are, that are coming up on the next couple of slides of why we've rallied and tried to stay attached to these big cultural moments um, and still be positive and still be, you know, it, it doesn't have to be doom and gloom. And I think when we saw in March and April, we know there are serious circumstances around us, but the ad messaging, and this has been, you know, parodied at this point, the ad creative was just so dour in so many industries. And I think we didn't need to make light of what was going on in the world, but we could also say, hey, we are, we are humans, we are a lifestyle brand, we still understand your life, even though it's a different set of circumstances around us, and we still want to be that positive moment in your day. You know, Andy, you, you mentioned that um, these are challenging times and circumstances, and people still do want that sense of normalcy, and they still want to be able to watch um, their favorite TV show, listen to their new album, or watch their sports when they can. Uh, they still want a positive moment in their day, which may look to food delivery as that something. Can you talk about the human connection and sense of community Postmates is encouraging and what it means in the world we're operating in today? Yeah, I think it started with that campaign that we were talking about with Order Local. Um, when people think of community, think of what are the places that I go to all the time that I'm just not thinking about right now because I've become so insular. I'm thinking about my safety and I'm thinking about my family, and I'm thinking about my job, all important. So we've tried to gracefully say, hey, you can do what you were doing before, but do it by bringing food to your house as a way to support these businesses. And I think challenge number two is um, really honing back down in, and Harris mentioned this too, um, Colleen mentioned this as well, it's like, what do we do at our core? Um, and one of the things that we do at our core is uh, provide the ability to bring people things. And I know that sounds novel, but I think then saying, who needs these things brought to them? How do we connect the dots between stuff that we can send out into the world and people who need it? And so really rallying with um, third-party causes, things like a campaign that we launched or a partnership we launched with an organization um, called Feed Hero Nurses. Feed Hero Nurses, um, you know, we can, I think, jump to the next slide if it's not up already. Um, taking that same stronghold of a lot of the campaign we work we do, but then connect it to uh, people that need deliveries or can benefit from, um, from things that we can bring to them. So here's a small snapshot of some of the things that, that we've done, uh, and there's many more. This first one is with uh, an artist called Halsey who has a track that was produced by Marshmallow and they wanted to bring positivity. The song was called Be Kind and they really wanted to come and say, how can we be kind when we're all stuck at home and we can't do a tour and we can't do publicity. So um, in this campaign, we actually cranked up the donations to our fleet members, the people that were essential and the people that were bringing deliveries to people. The second one is in partnership with the World Central Kitchen. Um, and when Katy Perry's album dropped, she did a massive donation um, to this, this group, a uh, church in LA that she had a connection with. Uh, and the same thing for, for Gaga's album drop, which we had um, a donation based on orders for her album dropping uh, also in partnership with the World Central Kitchen. So we went big in saying, how can some of the campaign work we do be connected to whether it's frontline healthcare workers, it's the people that are working and deserving and are in need at this, at this time. And I think we've had programs like this in the background, um, using the Postmates technology to connect those with uh, food, with those who need food. But I think um, actually rallying around it and putting it at the centerpiece of a lot of our campaign work has been a big shift and one that will continue well beyond pandemic time. So let's talk about going big in campaign work. Um, Postmates was recently named as the official on-demand food delivery partner of the NFL, including official sponsorships of major events such as the Super Bowl, Pro Bowl, and the draft. How are the collaborations like these helping you reframe the consumer journey as experiential or as being lifestyle driven or focused? Uh, what benefits and challenges has this posted to you? Uh, yeah, it, it still kind of ladder back to trying to be around these moments that people set their watch by, and the NFL season was one of them. I know uh, my colleague Molly is actually on the call right now, and she deserves far more credit than I do, so it almost feels strange to speak to, but in partnership with their team and with others, um, 
creating a new category inside the NFL is not one that comes up that often. They have these official partnerships and these official um, titles that are things like the mobile carrier of or the official truck of. And so food delivery was a new category. It was up for grabs, it was up for discussion. But again, these are ones that we shouldn't take lightly. They last for a long time. They have a lot of moving, a lot of moving pieces and parts. And as we went into this partnership with the NFL, we wanted to make sure, yes, like you said, customer journey, we're gonna introduce the brand to a lot of people for the first time, but we wanna do it in a way that still feels like Postmates. We started the season off, for example, going to a couple of star players that were in the very first game of the season that are household names, Deshaun Watson from the Texans and Patrick Mahomes, who's you know, the biggest name in football. And we did deliveries to frontline healthcare workers from them in the opposing team cities to frontline healthcare workers. And it was pretty special to see them fully supported on social, fully get behind it um, to try to connect. Again, they're trying to do the same thing that we are and the same thing the rest of this talent and artists are, which are, there's nobody in the stadium. How do they still make people feel connected to the game and still story tell before and after they put their helmet on and go do what they do amazingly well. And so I think we continue to do that. You'll see that throughout the season. Um, we've made some new creative that's running with the NFL. That's some of the most fun work that we've ever done. Save that for another time. Uh, but I, I think the whole path has been, how do we remain a lifestyle brand? And lifestyle is our differentiator. Um, we think people know how apps work. People know they can open an app on their phone, press a button, get a burrito delivered. But to do it in a way that feels like these people get me, these people get my kind of busy, complicated life um, and how we fit into it has been our goal. You mentioned the Oscars is a big day for you guys. I can only imagine how big it must have been when the Dodgers won the World Series. Like, did you see like a massive spike in like uh, in food deliveries? Yeah, I mean, this is where, you know, I want to say lightning in a bottle. We've had a partnership with the Dodgers. We're the official on-demand food delivery partner of the Dodgers. And back when mm -hmm. you could go to games, we've made a big bet on the Dodgers because the Dodgers are in our number one market in LA. And um, the Thing that we've piloted over the last couple of years is the ability to go to events and use Postmates to do things that, um, again, seem kind of novel, but once you're in it, you're like, wait, I can skip the line. I can order all my food ahead of time. We started this at Coachella two years ago um, and we knew we were onto something. So we launched a pilot at Dodger Stadium. Again, what do people do when they pay a lot of money for a baseball ticket or a basketball ticket? They don't want to spend 30 or 45 minutes in line. They want to sit in their seat. They want to order and you'll get a thing that says, hey, it's ready. And then you can go pick it up. So we had a successful start to that. Obviously, rethink, change, but the partnership existed. Um, so we launched um, the Dodgers uh, Kitchen, which is our ability to deliver Dodger food at home. And yeah, we had a, our, our biggest night ever during the World Series. Um, game ended, we gave free delivery to everybody that's in the LA market. And so um, we're off to the races, we're psyched about it, but um, you know, a, a big, at any time where people are at home and they're excited about what's going on, especially if that thing's on TV, uh, you can expect that uh, orders are gonna follow. In a great year for LA, no, pro no, no doubt about that. Let's talk a little bit more about the ways in which Postmates is supporting communities today. Uh, but also let's talk about it like, in terms of how you're going to continue to support local communities in the months and years ahead. I mean, I think that your support of black owned small businesses has just been such a great example of this. And so, yeah, talk, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, this slide will, will give you a glimpse of how we were thinking about the world. And there was a broader conversation that I think at every single person, every single team, every single business thinking, man, are we, are we set up to operate appropriately in this world? And I, I think we're very idealistic as a brand. We want to do right by the people who use our product, the merchants that are on the product. But one of the places that we focused on and we as a team said, where can we have the most impact was how can we support and rally uh, black owned businesses? And how do we do it in a way that again, feels true to how we market and how we express uh, all the time. And so you can see this was the launch of the black owned restaurants collection. Um, and, and it, I mean, I think everybody's dealt with this, but I think for me, the exciting thing was you go from Thursday to Monday over a five day span, like you went from what should we do to, um, there's no such thing as a whiteboard session, but us just like, we could do this, we could do this to live in the world in a short amount of time. And the people that are bringing this work to life are all in. Right? They're like, right. yes, if, if this technology that we've made can potentially do this, let's do it. Now, flashback, I think the thing for us, learning lesson for us is as we went through this exercise, there was no button that you could push that said, hey, take all the black owned businesses that are amazing and put them in one place because 
we don't ask for that attribute. And in retrospect, we should have been. Um, but when you think about a merchant, a restaurant, who's got a staff, you're trying to say, use this tablet or plug this into your existing software. Here's how it's gonna work with your payments. It's very utilitarian, right? We don't ask a question like, are you black owned? Because as you pass somebody a tablet or send it to them in the mail, again, in retrospect, I think if two years ago, we were sitting in the product team and saying, hey, we should ask when we send somebody a tablet, if it's a black owned business. Um, again, I don't think that, that in retrospect, we should have been asking more of these attributes that define your persona as a restaurant owner, but the work is done now so that we can not just talk about black owned businesses in the future, but talk about minority owned businesses, talk about LGBTQIA businesses. We can try to um, create not only collections, but not do it with such a manual lift and make sure that it's coming from the merchants themselves who want to storytell around that. So um, that's you know, where we started, but I think the, the fun part and the rest of that slide that, that would tell the story, but we should jump forward in time is, is how do we bring our marketing uh, power and our marketing engine behind it? Because I think for us, that's the thing that, that I think really means we're in and we're in for a long time. We told the stories of merchants and brought forward the stories of people who've been entrepreneurs and started their own businesses for many, many years to try to make sure that people still felt that connection to not just this abstraction of a place group in an app, but the people who actually are working so hard uh, to run these businesses every day. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Andy. Thanks really for sort of walking us through all of that. It's super inspiring work. Um, let's bring on the other speakers. Let's bring on Colleen and Harris. Um, and uh, yeah, let's kick off our sort of audience Q&A. So as we're just sort of welcoming our speakers back on. Hey guys, thanks so much for, for sticking around and for rejoining. So I have a question just to kick us off and then we'll, we'll go to some audience questions as well. But one of the things that sort of like strikes me when we have these conversations, when we hear about the work you guys have been doing this year, I'm curious to know in to what extent does your values, your business's values, the core values that you have stood up these organizations on matter? Like how meaningful has that been? How much have you had to really lean on your core values over the course of this year, particularly when you've been making important decisions in the moment to think about the ways in which you sort of support your communities? Harris, why don't you go first? Yeah, I mean, we've always been for what creator first, meaning we stand for the people on our platform that are creating content. And when you put things through that lens, you do always what's in their best interest. So the product development to the campaigns, to the to everything that you're working on, how you communicate with them, if you put them first front and center, then it <coughs> makes your decision framework a lot easier, right? Is this good for them? Are we helping them? Uh, is what we're doing now going to help them? And I think about one thing we didn't discuss is over the summer, we did a campaign called Get Business Moving, where we gave our tools free for 90 days for all small businesses because we knew they were struggling. How do they get back on their feet as things started to open up? So that is can we take a short-term loss to help them get back on their feet? Because ultimately, if our community doesn't thrive, we don't exist. So that is our view, that is our lens, and we put our community first. All these other issues are a lot easier. They're still hard to make decisions, but it's easier when you have that constant framework. Definitely. I mean, Colleen, you know, Pinterest, one of the reasons why I love the platform so much is it really is a platform that represents positivity. So same question for you, you know, how did you lean on the kind of the, the, the core values of Pinterest at this time in regards to how, how you as an organization and as a platform responded to the moment? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and our core values are something we all talk about every single day and they all, they're always our North star, right? So we, we actually have three. So inclusivity, inspiring content and emotional well-being. And of course that all adders back up to, you know, us being a positive place and a, a positive corner of the internet. And so, you know, as we thought about things and as issues came up, we always went back to those. Was this, you know, whether it was Black Lives Matter or now the election, are there things that we can take action on in a meaningful way? And if not, and if it ties back to these um, values, if not, we're not gonna do it. So. We've never allowed political ads on the platform, and therefore, we um, we haven't leaned into the election at all, um, other than giving resources to voters in our Today tab. So those are just you know minor decisions, but they ladder up to the broader mission and, and values that we uh, have every day. Yeah, same question for you, Andy. But I, I'm also curious to know how the leadership within Postmates kind of communicates those values and how they sort of reinforce them in your sort of internal communications and discussions? 
Yeah, I mean, it helps by, um, I think a mantra even from the very early days of Postmates, you know, we're coming, we're in the Bay Area, we're coming up in an environment where this question of what do you stand for and what can technology enable is happening all around us. And I started two years ago, so this was well in motion before I got there. But I think you feel this weight of, hey, you've made this really cool thing. And I always call it the superhero dilemma, which is um, you can do something that's pretty cool. And every tech company and every fundraising deck has like, we built a superpower. I'm sure you guys have this deck in some slide somewhere. And I'm like, okay, superhero dilemma. You have a superpower. Every superhero struggles with, do you use it for good? Uh, do you use it for things that are not good? And we don't need to have a separate panel about who used it for not good, but I think that weight of, right, you made it, did you use it for good, sits very heavily on us as a team. And that's where things like, I mentioned this program, which we call Food Fight, the ability to take that same technology that we built, which you can open your app and you can press a button and somebody can bring you something, but to connect a huge network of people with food surplus restaurants and people who have needs, which are shelters and organizations, we launched that two years ago and it's been a massive accelerant for that. So a lot of those underpinnings were there and I don't think needed this double down, triple down for management to say, great, hey, a reminder, it's there. I think it's very born in. I'm not saying we haven't talked about these things and, and the creation of the Black Owned Merchants Place Group was very um, important to our leadership and got a ton of very direct, not in this dictatorial go do this way, but like, we think this is important. We're gonna do things like fund free delivery to every merchant. We're, as you onboard, we're gonna waive your merchant fees for a duration of time to make that transition easier as Harris mentioned. And so mm -hmm. those are things that are not small decisions, right? I can't just decide in the room as a marketing person, like that's gonna go over pretty well. It's like, those are huge levers that we need to pull. And again, people from a supporting standpoint, even from an ideation standpoint said, we should do this. This really means that we're, we're, we're uh, talking the talk here. Awesome. Todd, off. I think you, uh, Todd, I think you have a question from the audience. Yeah, uh, Diana has a question specifically for you, Harris. Uh, right. What are you guys doing for the multicultural market? Uh, so we, we have, there's, there's multiple things. So one is we have a, a lot of templates of supporting black owned businesses. We've been very, aside from the monetary contributions that we made, which we think help, with the biggest responsibility we have as a platform with reach is how do we amplify voices? So one of that is we've created channels and amplifying voices of black and minority owned filmmakers and creators and businesses and sharing their stories with the world, which we have much bigger reach than any of them would have on their own. Uh, and additionally, we're partnering with other platforms of how do we highlight these businesses across those platforms so we get them more. And we do have another grant project that we're not ready to launch, uh, speak about yet, but that's coming down the pipe that is specifically focused on how do we help communities uh, and have an amplifying effect. Because one thing that we really care about is not just moments where you could say we did this and then they're fleeting and you forget about them, is how do we have a lasting impact? And we believe that supporting communities and helping them thrive and giving them the tools to succeed has a rippling effect. And if we could use our platform to amplify that and make that those ripples, that'll be the lasting impact that we care about versus these statements that are very easy to make in the moment, but then don't have a lasting impact. So that's really where we focus on is how do we leverage our platform and community to have a bigger impact than we could have on just our own. Colleen, um, Barbara Tonelli in the audience has a question for you. She wants a little bit more detail around the skin tone feature that you mentioned. Can you talk about that from like the product and platform standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as you can imagine, millions of people are searching for beauty inspiration each month on, on Pinterest within our beauty category. And so we launched this feature last year and then this year we really improved upon it and expanded it to um, UK, Canada, Ireland, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, and then we're going to continue to roll it out in, in certain markets, but more tactically how it works when you search any, you know, beauty inqu inquiry, for example, bold eyeshadow, then underneath your search bar, it will say pick a skin tone range and four um, multicolored pills will pop up, um, which feature within them four different skin tones. So 16 different skin tone ranges visually. And then you would pick on one, you know, the skin tone that appeals to you. And, um, and then the search result would actually show, you know, people and ideas within that skin tone, um, that tie back to your search result of bold eyeshadow. So it's, I encourage you to go play with it. It's really fun. And um, we also launched an AR try-on for lip color. So you can actually try it on yourself 
um, and more to come on, on all those features, but just the beginning to continue to appeal and make sure that we have more diverse content on the platform. Thanks for that. We, we have another question from Erica in the audience. Uh, this is to all the panelists, uh, for those that want to answer this one. Gathering quicker, faster, more relevant insights to remain consumer-centric is essential today. How are you finding the balance in quantity versus quality of the data you're using? Let's go for you, Andy. Oh, I knew you were going to say that. Um, I mean, we're, we're, we all work at technology companies. Uh, I think we run the risk of being overwhelmed by data um, all over the place. And I don't say that in a bad way. I don't start a meeting with like, hey, let's not hear all the great insights and information that we have access to. But there are more data analysts that work at Postmates than marketers. Uh, I don't know that for sure, but I'm going to take a pretty big guess that that's accurate. And, and so I think there's the real-time things that are coming from the platform that can tell us great things. And then there's things that are coming from the outside world that say, here's what we should pay attention to. Here's what we should be talking about. Here should, here's how we should move our ad dollars. And I think sometimes you have to build a team that can take those things in. We do all the time. But um, as, as a team that I think prides ourselves and, and rallies, to say, um, what do we know that somebody else either might not know yet, or what bet can we make that our competitors won't make, or what can we talk about that others might not? We try to have this tinker quotient as a team to bring on stuff and talk about things. And sometimes, by the way, we're even telling our own management team, we had a program, we launched this thing called the TikTok Kitchen yesterday in LA, which is food yeah. trends are one of these things that's coming off of TikTok and things like whipped coffee and cloud bread, uh, there's a conversation around, but that doesn't exist in the wild yet. So we've actually opened with our local businesses and our exclusive merchants, some of these menu items that are coming in real time off of TikTok, they're blowing up. We go over to the merchant and say, here's what cloud bread is, or here's how you make cloud bread. And so I think it's, it's trying to say, um, where is there a there there that we feel inspired by? We can actually talk about TikTok Kit is a good example and I could go on, but I, I think it's trying to then say internally, I go to our CEO and say, we should start making cloud bread. He, he, I have a lot of work to do to try to get him to understand <laughs> what we're talking about. And I think I, you know, we're used to that as a business, but for those who are out there in, in places that don't work like that, I think you have to come like this question says smartly with the quality and try to storytell around it because um, you can have so many different data points. I think it's hard to isolate where we think the win is the company. Colleen, what about you? Drowning in data, how are you, uh, how are you focusing on the quality? Yes, it's a good question. You know, we spend a lot of time speaking to creators and pinners, and I think that is the most important to us. You know, we have, a, we sit on all this data, right? We know what people are searching. We know how they're planning. We can start looking at predictions. You know, we have our Pinterest 100 trends that we release at the end of every year for the future year. So data is always at our fingertips, but I think the most important thing you can also do is truly just talk to your consumer and make sure that you're gathering those, those nuggets and insights from them. And so I think for me, that is the most interesting part of it is getting that face time and be able to dig in. And that for me is really quality. And Harris, for you as well, like how has data kind of informed some of the decisions you've made this year? I'm going to take a little spin, hopefully from the external, the, the, the community's perspective. So one is there's, there's micro and macro data and a stat that I don't know how many people know is uh, that's really interesting is when you post a piece of a video on social media platforms, 75% of the views happen in the first four days. That means you post something on Monday and by Friday, no one's seeing it. So the enormity of that weight of having to create so much content and what's working is a lot for, for small businesses and large businesses. It's a lot for Vimeo who has a large team as well. So you have to have real good insights to see what's working. And what works on Pinterest doesn't work on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. So knowing what works on the platforms that you're serving and reaching customers is really important. So in that perspective, from your own worldview, you have to be looking at that that micro level data to see what works specifically for you, your audiences on each platforms can form the types of content you're making. And what I would say is quantity versus quality, it depends on what your goal is. So if it's short form, it's social, you know that it's not gonna have a long shelf life, having more frequent posts and having it be really relevant is really important. So quantity matters there. If this is a brand video, it's your mission or your purpose video and it's gonna live on your website for six months, a year, that's where you wanna focus on quality. You know that shelf life is there, you have a statement to make, quality is really important. And then the last thing on, on macro level data where we are a platform, we have the ability to take insights from everyone 
and give you what works on different platforms. So if you're a real estate company and you want to know what works on MLS or Zillow or on your own website, the types of videos that you create, those are different. So we could surface insights of you should really open your video with an aerial shot of the home or you having interior shots works better on Zillow. Things like that where we could leverage the, the power of our community to give real insights to help you succeed faster is really important. So I think macro big data informs like the micro decisions that everyone has to make because there are trade-offs, right? There's limited resources. No matter how big of a company you are, you can only do so many things in a day. So I think having those insights really informs what you should spend your time on. Thank you so much for saying it. Well, that is all the time we have. So I'm going to hand it back to Todd, who's going to wrap up this morning's event. Guys, this was the fastest hour of all times. And uh, Toby, I applaud you and your team at Social Media Week. We absolutely love partnering and working with you here at TalkWalker. So thank you for really putting this together. And our all-star panel, Colleen, Andy Harris, you guys are awesome. And I hope we can kind of do this again in some shape or form, but in person at Social Media Week in New York. Um, or LA for that matter. Uh, with that said, um, this is going to be recorded. So for the audience, I wanna thank you for coming in and listening and feel free to share this with your colleagues. And please don't forget to go on to talkwalker.com to get that social media trends report. It's really good stuff out there. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Yeah.